Hey, this is Pastor Ian of Plus Life Church, and we're so excited that you found this resource, and we pray that it blesses you and edifies you in your own walk with God. Listen, we want to remind you that this is a supplement and doesn't replace your own time in God's Word, nor does it replace actual church. So if you're not plugged into a local body of Christ, we invite you to come join us for worship at Plus Life. All the information is in the description box below. Know that you are loved, you are loved, you are loved. God bless. And go ahead and tell someone beside you, across from you, the title of my sermon this morning, Battle Cry. You got to say it more fervently than that. Battle Cry. There's an exclamation there. Or there should be at least. As you all know, I'm a big nerd and a lot of the movies that I watch has to do with lots of these battles and these wars and of course, uh, a lot of these wars and these movies that, that have these battles always has some great speech before the two armies clash. And especially on the, on the good side where, where it seems like all hope is lost and the, the enemy is daunting and they are out, absolutely outnumbered. And the great commander gives a great speech and it rallies the troops. One of the great speeches that I know to date in movies is, of course, from The Return of the King, The Lord of the Rings, when... The armies of Gondor and the armies of Rohan has to march towards the black gates of Mordor. Uh, and, and they have to buy some time for Frodo to destroy the ring. And Aragorn comes up to the front and he gives his great speech. He says, a day may come when the courage of men fa fails, when we forsake our friends and break all bonds of fellowship, but it is not this day. An hour of wolves and shattered shields when the age of men comes crashing down. But it is not this day. This day we fight. So epic and so great. But what's interesting is that's not what rallies the people. Because after that scene, the, the, the black gates of Mordor open up and the hordes of orcs come out. And everybody gets a little bit afraid and everybody feels intimidated until Aragorn turns around to the people and he just whispers a soft battle cry and he says, for Frodo. And everybody charges into the midst of battle. I love that. I love that. And, and that's essentially what a battle cry is. It's, it's what bolsters the army. It's, it what, it's what gives confidence to, to the, the people and what rallies them to fight, even against the most uh, un unbelievable odds. And as I was praying into this last sermon of 2023 about, you know, what word I can bring to you and what encouragement from the Lord I can give as we enter into 2024, this is where we landed on. And, and more than just a word, but really a perspective and an attitude, sh an attitude shift as we go into the unknown, as we face whatever the new year holds for us, a battle cry for boldness, for confidence, a chain, uh, 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 as, as we charge into whatever the trials and troubles that the new year may bring. You know, the reality is the rest of the world is already unsure about 2024. We have wars happening already in the Middle East and in the Europe and all around the world that, that, that is ready to escalate and Election year next year for the cousins down south and all of that ramping up. And of course, the economy is the economy. And already you've been seeing these memes of people saying how they are unprepared for 2024. Yet all of that is natural for the world to, to fear or, 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 or to have a lack of confidence as they think about the new year, as the new year approaches. Because reality is, the world doesn't have a firm foundation, a ground to stand on. They don't have a place to anchor their hope. Really, it's all wishful thinking. Even all their plans and resolutions, all their ambitions, it's all castles made out of sand. But it's not so for the household of God, the people of God, the church. In fact, our Savior in our passage even declares it. He says, I will build my church and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. The gates of hell in ancient times represented death. It was associated and symbolic for the grave, for death itself. What's worse than that? The Savior is saying not even the pinnacle of what we ought to fear, what humanity can dread, what we can lose sleep over, we should not 
fear. Not even that will stand or prevail against his church. Notice, by the way, what our gates for. In, in a city or a, a, in a wall where there is a gate, what is that for? Is it something uh, to, is it an offensive mechanism or a defensive mechanism? It's defensive. It's meant to keep things out. So the picture that Christ is presenting is the church is, is unable to be stopped on its offensive towards the gates of hell, towards enemy territory. The gates of hell is meant to keep people out, but not even that can prevail against God's church. This passage is a call to boldness, to courage, a rallying, a rallying cry for the kingdom, because that's what it's calling us to, a kingdom mentality. And this, 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 this courage that we hear in our passage is not based or rooted on some wishful thinking or something flimsy like the world. Our passage, as we'll explain and, and go on in our sermon, it's rooted in, in something that's foundational, truths that, that, that govern our reality and our world. A sure foundation, a rock, a solid rock that we can stand on even as we go into the new year. So my hope for us this morning as we unpack our passage is to see where our confidence can come from. To see where our courage ought to come from. The faith that secures us. To see what the truths that ought to bolster our faith as we enter into the new year and face whatever challenges might come. Our desire this morning is to see what our battle cry is as believers, a reason why we can be courageous in the new year, regardless of what may come our way. Ultimately, my hope is that if you feel uncertain about the new year, about maybe your job situation, your family situation, your health situation, if you feel hopeless and discouraged, or as everybody else feels, unprepared for 2024, that you would be emboldened this morning, not to depend on yourself or the things of this world, but be emboldened by the truths of our Savior found in his word. So for the last time in 2023, let's jump into God's word together and unpack it for us. Everyone say, jump. Amen. Amen. <coughs> Excuse me. Um, I'm battling a little cough here, but we'll get through this. So in context to our passage uh, this morning, our, our, our passage takes place sort of towards the middle and to the end of Jesus' earthly ministry. This comes after a lot of miracles, a lot of sermons being preached, after a great miracle of Jesus feeding the 4,000, and, and this whole discourse about the, the unleavened bread of the Sadducees or the, the religious elites. And as the passage picks up, we pick up in verse 13 where Jesus is finally alone with his Disciples, And let's read this passage for us again. Verse 13. Now when Jesus came into the district of Caesarea Philippi, he asked his disciples, who do people say that the Son of Man is? Again, it's about two years into Jesus' earthly ministry. He's done a lot of miracles. He's met a lot of people, preached a lot of good news. And he's asking the disciples, what do people say about me? What are people saying? Who, who do they think I am? And of course, in verse 14, the, the, the disciples answer, some say John the Baptist, others say Elijah, others Jeremiah, or one of the prophets. Interesting to note that they're only saying the good comparisons, right? The disciples are just saying, oh, you, people say that you're like John the Baptist, or like Elijah, or one of these other prophets. It's interesting because throughout the Gospels, we know that the religious elites, they, they call Jesus like Satan, even associate him with Beelzebub. But they, don't, they leave that out, and so Jesus gets to the heart of the matter. What's really important in all of this, verse 15, he says, he says to them, But who do you say that I am? Who do you say that I am? Now, you have to understand, this is the most important question for every human being on this world. This is the most important question for every individual to answer because it ultimately defines our eternity. Who do we say Jesus is? And of course, Peter gives the only right answer to this question. Verse 16, he says, you are the Christ, the son of the living God. We're going to unpack that a little bit more. But then verse 17, Jesus says to him, blessed are you, Simon Barjona, 
For flesh and blood has not revealed this to you, but my Father who is in heaven. This echoes, of course, the idea that no one comes to the Father except the fa- except when the Father draws that individual to him. That's John chapter 6. Or it echoes the idea that it's the Holy Spirit that has to regenerate the stone heart and make it into a, or replace it with a heart of flesh so that an individual can have faith, so that an individual can come to Christ, as Ezekiel 36 declares. Unless the Father draws a person, draws a man, they cannot come to this confession of faith. Keep that in mind because that's the whole point of this passage. Now, just, just, as, just a quick recap here. The order of events that we see here is that Jesus asks his disciples, who do people say I am? Then the, that progresses to, who do you say I am? And of course, at, at the, the, the behest of the Father, the revealing of the Holy Spirit, Peter makes this great confession that you are the Christ, the Son of the living God. That's the order of events here, and that's important because we get to the more controversial part of our passage, the one that's highly debated throughout many church traditions and uh, throughout uh, church history. Look at verse 18 and 19 with me. It says, I tell you, you are Peter, and on this rock I will build my church, and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. I will give you the keys of the kingdom of heaven, and whatever you bind on earth shall be bound in heaven, and whatever you loose on earth shall be loosed in heaven. Now, the reason why, and you probably know this, but the reason why this is a very much a controversial passage is, is because the Roman Catholic Church uses this passage to support or to enforce the authority of the papacy. Um, the, the Pope, or rather the head of what they say, the head of the church. The argument from the Catholic Church is that they claim that this passage is Jesus appointing Peter as the head of the church. Thus, Peter became the first Pope, rather, the head of the church in, in the Catholic tradition. And because Peter was, in tradition-wise, the first bishop or the first pastor of the church of Rome, they say, they argue rather, that the lineage of whoever is in charge of the church comes from the Roman church. Uh, All the bishops and all the the, the priests that come after Peter who, who led the church of Rome. Now, again, this all stems from that word play that we just read in verse 18, where Jesus says to Peter, uh, he says, And I tell you, you are Peter, and on this rock I will build my church, and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. Peter, in the original Greek, means, or is is petros, meaning rock, or small rock. And then when Jesus says, on this rock, he's using another word, petra, which means a a large cliff, or a large cliff. A larger rock. And so the Roman Catholic Church is ultimately arguing that this rock that the church is built on is Peter himself. This man, Peter, this this rock, so to speak. It's also where we get the idea, if you've ever seen these cartoons based, based on Catholic ideology, where Peter is standing at the gates of heaven and he's the one who's letting people in, we get it from this passage as well, because as our passage says, the keys of heaven is given to Peter as, as interpreted by the Catholic Church. Now, all of that said, that's their argument. All of that said, aside from a lack of historical evidence that Peter was ever the bishop or the pastor at Rome, we simply need to look at the context of a passage and the rest of Scripture to refute any notion that Peter was the foundational rock of the church or was the head of the church or was more highly revered than the apostles. Firstly, the point of our passage is once again that great confession of faith, the identity of Christ as revealed by the Father through the lips of Peter. Again, remember the context. The context of this is who do people say I am? Who do you say I am? And by the will of the Father, by the revealing of the Holy Spirit, Peter says, you are the Christ, the Son of the living God. The purpose, the focal point of this passage is the identity of Christ. It's, it, that, that's the whole reason of it. And, and the, the, what, what, what determines, rather, is someone, again, just being part of or being a believer is this confession of faith. 
It's, it's what determines someone as a child of God, this confession of whether or not someone believes that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of the living God. And again, we'll unpack that in a bit. But Christ is saying that he is going to build his church upon those with that similar confession. That's the rock in which Christ is going to build his church. And we'll see this in a bit here. Secondly, aside from that being the focal point of the passage, secondly, Though Peter may be one of the first to make that confession, we know that he is not the only one to make that confession. Anyone that the Father reveals this truth to, that the Holy Spirit opens their heart to, will make this confession. As, uh, and we even see this in Christ's words in our passage, verse 19, he says, when he says, I will give you the keys of the kingdom of heaven, in the original Greek, that word you is plural, meaning he's speaking to all the disciples. Not just Peter. Peter plays more of a representative role for all the apostles in this, in this passage, but as we all know that the apostles all in some way or degree, even Paul says that they are the foundations of the church because Christ has given them specifically the same authority that is being described here. And they all make that same confession that Jesus is the Christ and the living God, the Father, reveals that truth to them. So what does Jesus mean with, with, when he says in verse 18, and I tell you, Peter, that you, are, uh, that you are Peter, and on this rock I will build my church, and the gates of hell will not prevail? Well, simply, again, as we're mentioning here, Christ is building his church upon those who have a similar confession of faith as Peter does in our passage. A faith that has been revealed by the Father, that has been given by the Holy Spirit. A faith that declares Jesus is the Christ and the Son of the living God. How do we know this? Well, because Peter himself says this in his own epistle. Look at 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 4 to 7 with me. Peter says in his letter to the churches, he says, As you come to him, a living stone rejected by men, but in the sight of God, chosen and precious, you yourselves, like living stones, are being built up as a spiritual house to be a holy priesthood, to offer spiritual sacrifices acceptable to God through Jesus Christ. I, I can't help but imagine that as Peter is writing this, he's having this flashback of this scene in, in Matthew chapter 16, when, when Christ tells him that he is, uh, he is a rock, and upon, this, that, upon that faith, uh, that confession of faith, that he's going to build his church upon. Here is very clear. He is not alone. He, he alone is not the rock in which the church is being built upon, but rather every believer who makes a confession that Jesus is their Savior and that he is their God. If you are a believer in Christ today, you are a living stone being built up with Peter and the rest of the apostles to build up this spiritual house of God, his church, the church of God. In addition to that, if there's, any, uh, if there's any doubt that Peter is not the, the head of the church, Peter even makes it very clear in that same passage, 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 6 to 7 now. He says, For it stands in Scripture, Behold, I am laying in Zion a stone, a cornerstone chosen and precious, and whoever believes in him will not be put to shame. So the honor is for you who believe, but for those who do not believe, the stone that the builders rejected has become the cornerstone. This cornerstone, this chosen and precious, or in some translations, it says this chief cornerstone. The cornerstone is sort of the foundational rock that holds everything else together in ancient times or ancient buildings. This chief cornerstone is who? Jesus. He is the head of the church. And that's also corroborated by Paul in his letters, 1 Corinthians chapter 12 and Ephesians chapter 5. Jesus is the head of the church. There's no mention of Peter or any papacy. In fact, in Paul's letter to the Romans in, that was written 27 years after the resurrection of Christ, there's no mention of Peter whatsoever being the bishop there or being the being the, the pastor there at the Church of Rome, and, and the Church of Rome had already been established for quite many years. So, I mean, we see, even see in our passage, right, in verse 18, again, when, when Jesus says, I tell you, you are Peter, on this rock I will build my 
church. Jesus is saying that he's the one who's going to build his church, that he's the foundation for his church. Now, all of this to say that this church that Christ um, says is, is the one that's not, that, that, that the gates of hell is not going to prevail against, the church that can have confidence and boldness to face even the greatest of fears that humanity can know, which is death itself, this church is built upon the, the, this confession that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of the living God. And it's the same confession that ought to be our battle cry as we approach this new year. The thing that ought to bolster us and encourage us as we face the unknown. It is this faith in these truths that give us hope and security even in uncertain times. This confession is our battle cry. <coughs> Let's break this battle cry, this confession down, of, this confession of faith down a little bit so we have a, 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 a deeper understanding of it because it's steeped with great truths and sometimes truths that we often take for granted or, or we forget. These truths are really the basis of our Christian faith and it's what we take into the new year with confidence and what gives us hope. But again, not even the, 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 the gates of hell can prevail again. So, what does this battle cry say of ours? What does this confession say? First and foremost, that Jesus is Savior. Jesus is Savior. Jesus is the Christ. Again, Peter says, the Christ, meaning the Messiah, the anointed one of God, the one prophesied from days of, of old, from the Old Testament, from the prophets of old. The one who was promised to redeem his people. First of all, you have to understand how, how bold of a, of a, of a thing for, for Peter to say this. In Peter's context, you have to understand that it, this is not an easy claim to, to proclaim. Many men before Jesus and after Jesus claimed to be the Messiah, the one to redeem God's people. By Peter proclaiming Jesus as the Christ, he's sort of putting all his eggs in one basket. Betting his, own, betting his entire life, his whole life, on this idea, on this truth. And in spite of uh, the, the, the Jewish leaders opposing Jesus and threatening to, to ostracize the disciples or anyone who followed Jesus and kick them out of the Jewish society and kick them out of the, uh, of the synagogues, Peter is, is boldly proclaiming this truth, that Jesus is the Christ. He's betting everything on Christ even his eternity. In proclaiming Jesus as Christ and Savior is, of course, not just Savior for this life, but Savior when it comes to sin and death and the wrath of God. Someone who confesses Christ as Savior and Lord is, is putting all their hopes and eternal security not in human works, not in one's righteousness, not in one's church attendance and their giftings and talents and everything that they've done for God. They're putting all their hopes and trust, their security in Jesus Christ. They're putting their faith in Jesus to save them. And they're trusting, and for us on this side of the cross, we are trusting that he has saved us by his life, death, and resurrection that his righteousness is, is enough to impute upon us so that we would be justified before the Father. That his death is enough to pay for our sins and wash us and forgive us of our sins. That his resurrection validates all his claims. Proclaiming Jesus is, is our is, is, is Savior and proclaiming that Jesus is our Savior specifically is proclaiming that we have been forgiven of sin. That, that we, are, we are wholly dependent on him for our salvation. How does this apply in, in the new year? And how does this work out for our battle cry? And what gives us confidence for the new year? Well, for those of us who are still struggling with the shame and the guilt of our sinful past, or even our sinful present, for those who are looking towards the new year and, and feel hopeless because you feel like you're not going to change, that you're still going to continue to struggle with whatever it is that you're struggling with, the same mentality, same weaknesses into the new year, into 2024. Maybe you're, you're, you're sitting here thinking that, man, I'm going to be carrying the same sins into the new year, the same tendencies, same mentality, same mindsets. Listen, 
Jesus is our Savior, is our glorious battle cry that proclaims that we have truly been saved, that we have truly been forgiven and justified and redeemed, that our sins are not counted against us, that God sees us with the righteousness of Christ. That's why we can boldly enter into the new year. That's why our sins should no longer be a weight to us as we enter into the unknown. Listen, in 2024, when an enemy comes accusing us of sin and guilt and shame, when, he, when, when we feel unworthy, when we feel unworthy to be in God's presence and we are reminded of our sin, this battle cry reminds us of the gospel of Jesus Christ. The gospel that declares that God has made a way so that we can be forgiven of our sins. A gospel that declares that Christ has already accomplished our redemption at the cross and in the grave. It is a gospel that declares that it is well with my soul, that even when my sin, oh the bliss of this glorious thought, my sin not in part, but the whole is nailed to the cross and I bear it no more. Praise the Lord, praise the Lord, oh my soul. A glorious hymn. A glorious thought that all our sin has been nailed to the cross of Christ. And we have been completely forgiven. Listen, there's no doubt that in 2024 there will be times where we stumble, where we will falter in our faith, where we will, where we will sin. But our hope is not in perfection in this world, but that we are being sanctified by Christ. That we have already been justified, declared righteous in the eyes of God, and in that process, in that time period between justification and glorification, Christ is walking with us to sanctify us through all those things. The author and perfecter of our faith, our Savior. We ought to have the same mentality or either this ought to bring us to the same mentality as Paul when he writes in, in the book of Romans when he says, well, wretched man that I am who will deliver me from this body of death. Speaking about his own struggles, his own failings as a human being, even as an apostle of Christ. He says, thanks be to God through Jesus Christ our Lord who gives a victory. That ought to be our mentality as we go into the new year. Our declaration is to say Jesus is Savior, our Savior. Everyone say Jesus is Savior. Man, none of you guys sound like you believe that. Whew. Jesus is Savior, is he not? What a glorious thought that we are entering into the new year without having to, to feel the weight of our sin because we can have a confidence that has been nailed to the cross of Christ. And we've been completely forgiven and accepted and received by a holy God, a sinful, depraved, un, undeserving, unworthy wretches that have been received by a loving and kind God because of what Christ has done on the cross. Jesus is Savior. Following that, what we see in our passage, it says in that confession was again, Paul said, or rather Peter says, you are the Christ, the Son of the living God. Here's a second battle cry that we can cry, that we can proclaim the new year. Jesus is God. Jesus is God. Another bold declaration by Peter this claim, as we know from our study in the Gospel of John, is a blasphemous claim, at least to the Jews. It's why the religious leaders hated Jesus and wanted to kill Jesus, because he was claiming to be the Son of God. In John chapter 5, verse 18, it explains this perspective. It says, this was why the Jews were seeking all the more to kill him, because not only was he breaking the Sabbath, but he was even calling God his own Father, making himself equal with God. That's what this declaration means. Being called the Son of God means that he was equal to God in nature, in power, and in authority. So for Peter to be proclaiming this, declaring that Jesus was indeed the Son of God, he was declaring Jesus as God, equal to the Father. 
Now understand what a giant leap this is for Peter. Really, anyone who declares this, anyone who confesses this in faith. And why? It only really comes from the Father. It's one thing to believe that Jesus was a good teacher, a moral teacher, a prophet even. It's one thing to believe that Jesus historically died on the cross. But it's a whole other thing to believe that Jesus is God. And yet this is what the word of God declares, that that Jesus is in fact divine. In Hebrews chapter 1 verse 3, it says, He is the radiance of the glory of God and the exact imprint of his nature, and he upholds the universe by the word of his power. After making purification for sins, he sat down at the right hand of the majesty on high. I love how in our passage, in our main passage here, Jesus recognizes that this confession that Peter makes has been revealed by God the Father himself. So really, it's God the Father who revealed to Peter that Christ is equal to God. Jesus is God. And note, by the way, the descriptor that Peter gives in this passage. He says, you are the son of the living God. The living God. This name of God, the living God, is very specific to the Old Testament. We see this all throughout the Old Testament, in fact. Deuteronomy chapter 5, for who is there of all flesh that has heard the voice of the living God? Here is how you shall know that the living God is among you. In Joshua, in in the book of Psalms, Psalm 42, my soul thirsts for God, for the living God. In the story of David and Goliath, when after David sees the Goliath and Goliath gives his challenge, To the armies of Israel, he says, David says, 1 Samuel 17, David said to the men who stood by, what shall be done for the man who kills this Philistine and takes away the reproach from Israel? For who is this uncircumcised Philistine that he should defy the armies of the living God? The name, the living God used in the Old Testament is meant to contrast between Yahweh, the living and true God, Versus the false gods of the pagans, the the idols of wood and stone. It's to say that we serve, we follow, we love the living God, the one true God, while others serve a false God. It's also to say that we serve a God that sees our trials, that hears our prayers, that is present in our hardships and our tribulations. One who is with us through the struggle and the suffering. And in the New Testament, it's to say that our God is the one who lives and intercedes for us. Jesus Christ. Peter repeats this imagery once again in, first, in his epistle, 1 Peter chapter 1, verse 3 to 4. He says, Blessed be the God and the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. There it is again, that, that equalization of the Son of God and, and God the Father. According to His great mercy, He has caused us to be born again to a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead to an inheritance that is imperishable, undefiled, and unfading, kept in heaven for you. Listen, the reason why Jesus is God is a battle cry for us. Should he ought ought to give us confidence as we enter into the new year, as we enter into 2024? The reason why we can have confidence in that is because we can trust that it is the living God who will see us through whatever hardships, whatever trials, whatever circumstances we face. It is the living God who will hear us when we cry out to him, when we pour out our hearts to him in the midst of suffering in the new year. It is the living God who cares and is, in, is present with us through it all, even in the unknown. Regardless of what may come, we serve the living God. Not, not idols of wood and stone, not ones who cannot hear us. The rest of the world can worship those things, but we do not. The people of God do not. Even the victories that we face. Even the victories and the triumphs that are ahead of us in the new year, the successes, we know that it is all from the hand of a loving God, the one who provides for us, the one who is working everything out for our good and his glory. We are God's people, 
We are the people of a living God who is with us through it all. In addition to that, the one who is in control. Again, as that passage in the Hebrew says, Jesus is the one who upholds the universe by the word of his power. He is the one who, uh, in Colossians, Paul says, he is before all things, and in him, in him all things hold together. That is our Savior. The Savior who died on the cross for us, out of his great love for us. The same, the same Lord who, who is alive today and is in control of our tomorrows, who is sovereign. What greater comfort do we have? What greater comfort do we have than to know that, that though we may not know what tomorrow brings, we know who holds our tomorrow. Jesus is God. I want to say Jesus is God. A little better. Lastly, our, our battle cry is, is not just in the confession that Peter gives, but really even the mindset and the perspective that Jesus gives to his disciples. In verse 19, it says, I will give you the kingdom, or rather the keys of the kingdom of heaven. Again, he's speaking to not just Peter, but all the disciples, and by proxy, everyone who has the same confession of faith. And whatever you bind on earth shall be bound in heaven, and whatever you loose on earth shall be loosed in heaven. Again, this is, this is plural. He's talking to everyone here. Jesus is speaking to not just Peter, but to all the apostles. Now, what is this idea of Christ giving the keys to the kingdom and this idea of binding and loosing things on earth? What, what, is, what is this all about? Again, the idea of, of, uh, of the keys to the kingdom is authority, authority to open the gates of the kingdom. And that's what the binding and loosing is talking about. But if you actually have an ESV Bible in front of you, you'll see there's a footnote there. Um, other translations or better translations there. It talks about how um, another translation of this is whatever you bind on earth shall have been bound in heaven and whatever you loose on earth shall have been loosed. The parallel to this concept that Jesus is bringing up here is in John chapter 20, verse 23. If you forgive the sins of any, they are forgiven them. If you withhold forgiveness from any, it is withheld. This, simply, this is simply stating the authority of believers to declare in accordance with the revealed word of God whether one is truly part of the kingdom or not. The idea, of, again, of the keys to the kingdom is granting access or giving the authority to permit entry into, the, or rather through the gates. We are, believers are called to be gatekeepers, so to speak. Uh, just maybe something more uh, practical way of explaining what this passage means. Imagine if we were in front of a gate, a gate that we've been given the keys to, say the gates of heaven. And, and again, the closing of this gate opening of this gate is the binding and loosing part of this. And say, as we're in front of this gate, say, Brother, um, someone I don't really pick on, uh, Brother Mark, uh, he approaches this gate and he's wanting entry into this gate. On what basis do we say, hey, Brother Mark is part of the kingdom? What basis do we say he's permitted to enter into, this, to, into the kingdom of God through these gates? Now, to say, that, to say that we have authority to allow him in through these gates, really by our word, by our choice, by, by, our permit, uh, by, by us permitting him through those gates, is really heresy, almost even blasphemy to equate ourselves with God. We're not Jesus. Admittance through this gate is based on what? What our passage says. That's this confession of faith that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of the living God, as the rest of Scripture uh, supports. So if Brother Mark, on that basis, has made that confession, we can confidently say that Brother Mark can go through these gates. Or not, right? And depending on whatever his confession is. So this binding and this loosening is simply proclaiming Really, what God has already determined in heaven by his standards and by his revealed word for that individual. Whatever you bind on earth shall have been bound. 
And whatever you loose on earth shall have been loosed. Again, it's all past tense. Peter and the apostles, and by proxy all believers who share a similar faith, have been given the authority to determine who is of the kingdom or who is not of the kingdom. Believers have the authority to declare, to proclaim what heaven has already determined, what has already been decreed in the revealed word of God about whether or not someone is truly a believer or not. That's what that entire passage means, really. Now, in the midst of that complex and nuanced passage, the underlying perspective that Jesus is trying to impress on his disciples that is, there, is that there is a kingdom that you are a part of, that we are a part of. And at the end of the day, in this kingdom, here's our last battle cry. Jesus is Jesus is king. This battle cry for us is one of courage and one that ought to embolden us, embolden us as we face a fallen and dark world. Jesus is king. And as such, we are citizens of his kingdom. We are his subjects, not the world. This kingdom mentality ought to shape our worldview, especially as we enter into the unknown of the new year. In a couple of ways. Firstly, we must not conduct ourselves like the world. Whether in behavior, in the way we speak, in the way we think, in the goals that we pursue, our desires in this life, We may have desires for the new year and and things that we want to accomplish, resolutions that we want to stick to, but do they reflect the, the desires of someone who is a citizen of heaven? This also means that as we go into the new year, we should be seeking to put to death any sin, any behavior, any habits, any mentalities that cause us to stumble, that cause us to 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 behave and act and think like the world and not represent a citizen of the kingdom of God. As the Bible says, put it away. Put it away. Put it to death. We are to conduct ourselves like citizens of heaven with desires and goals and pursuits that are suitable for someone of that kingdom, that kingdom of God. In 2 Corinthians chapter 5, Paul says, This, for the love of Christ controls us because we have concluded this, that one has died for all, therefore all have died, and he had died for all, that those who live might no longer live for themselves, but for him who for their sake died and was raised. From now on, therefore, we regard no one according to the flesh, even though we once regarded Christ according to the flesh, we regard him thus no longer. Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation, The old has passed away. Behold, the new has come. Paul is declaring that the citizens of heaven is a new creation, new nature, new desires, new thought patterns, new habits, new practices. Because we are representing the kingdom of God. Later in that passage, that's the passage that Paul says, we are ambassadors of Christ. Ambassadors of this kingdom of the king. So we must behave and conduct ourselves in such a way. Secondly, we must view the world in the lens of the kingdom. It's one thing to conduct ourselves in one way as representatives of the kingdom, but with everything that's going on in the world, all the the wars and rumors of wars and all the trials and tribulations and the crisis that is, is, is to surround every corner, We must view that in light of the kingdom and the king of that kingdom, Jesus Christ. In addition to that, we we must also have spiritual eyes to see that we are in spiritual warfare. That there are powers of darkness and authorities that, that linger in this world that tempt us to sin, that that deceive the masses. We must have eyes of the kingdom. But in the midst of all of that, 
in the tribulation that we'll see, in the spiritual warfare that we'll face, we must have great hope. Because Christ himself says, John 16, I have said these things to you that in me you may have peace. In the world you will have tribulation, but take heart, I have overcome the world. This world that we dread, this world that is full of tribulation, this world full of suffering, take heart, because the king has already conquered it. We serve a risen savior, a victorious king, one one who has put to open shame the powers of darkness, the authorities of darkness, one that has bound the strong man and is coming again to establish his kingdom for all of eternity. It's no secret that I'm of the mindset that the world is just getting worse. And it's easy to see, just read the news. But our hope is not in making this place a better place. It is in Christ who is returning and establishing his kingdom. Until then, and until then, he will preserve his bride. The gospel will be propagated. The number of believers will increase despite the hardships, despite the suffering, despite the tribulations, despite the world getting more and more secular and depraved. All because Jesus is king. It's funny, we, were, we, were, we, were, we had a leadership uh, uh, meeting last night with just the core team and the elders and their wives and Elder Joel said something that really struck me, and he said, we're on the winning team, guys. And that's the truth. That's the truth. Regardless of how history plays out, regardless of what is happening in the world, at the end of the day, we know who is coming. We know who is king. We know who's really in charge. This is a battle cry coming into the new year. Jesus is Savior, declaring that we have been forgiven of sin, that we have truly been redeemed, that his blood has washed us, and that we stand justified before a holy God. Jesus is God, the living God, the one who is in control, the one who is sovereign, the one who holds our tomorrows in every aspect of this universe together. And Jesus is king, our king, and we his ambassadors, we citizens of heaven. Just as we close here this morning, to the lost, to the lost, if, if I can just be frank, if you're listening to my voice and none of this makes sense to you or, or you, you don't call yourself a Christian, I can just be just honest with, them, with you a moment here. You have no hope going into the new year. You have no hope going into the new year. No plan for victory, no plan for success. Anything that you have is just based on wishful thinking. Nothing secure, nothing anchored to anything absolute. John says in his epistle, for everyone who has been born of God overcomes the world. And this is the victory that has overcome the world, our faith. Who is it that overcomes the world except the one who believes that Jesus is the Son of God? The reality is until you reconcile that in your own heart, who, again, answer this question, who is Jesus to you? Unless you get to that place where you wholeheartedly believe that Jesus is your Savior, the one who redeems you, and that he is God, the one you swear allegiance to. You have no hope for the new year, for the next year, for 10 years to come. You have to understand, as the Bible declares, that without Christ, without God working in us, without this hope we have in Christ, we are just rebels against God, and our destiny is hell. Face the wrath of God. Yet God being good and God being loving sent his son to die on on the cross in our place so that he can make a way, so that we can be reconciled to him. That's God's solution to that. That's God's solution to your depravity. Jesus Christ, his righteousness. 
And your response, the only response that the Bible asks you to, to make in light of that good news of Jesus Christ dying on the cross is not to do good works. It's not to do church attendance and, and give to the poor. None of that is simply to have faith in Christ. Have faith in Christ for your salvation, for your eternity. Until you put your faith in Jesus Christ as your Savior, your God, your King, until you have repented of your sins, there's no hope for you in the new year. And I pray that you would turn to God today. You would turn to God today. To the found, to my brothers and sisters, remember the rock that we stand upon. Remember that as, as Peter even declares that you are a living stone being built up in the household of God. Remember what that, that rock is built upon, that confession of faith that we have. Remember who it is that we say Jesus is. That Jesus is our Savior. That Jesus is our God. Jesus is our king. That's the hope, that's the confidence, that's the courage that we have as believers, as people of God. Our battle cry into the new year, regardless of what may come. Let the name above any other name be our battle cry. Let's pray. Lord, we thank you that our hope, our assurance for victory, our, our desires for, for, for forgiveness of sin is not rooted in us, it's not based on anything of this world but wholly dependent on you. We thank you, O God, that even as we enter into the new year, that we have a sure foundation, that we have a rock to stand upon, so that regardless of what may come, what trials, what tribulations, what hardships, what sorrows, what sufferings, we can declare in confidence that you are our Savior through it all, just as you have been in the past. That you are our God who is sovereign over it all, just as you have been in the past. And that you are King over it all, now and forever. So I pray, O oh God, for the heart that dreads tomorrow, the heart that is uncertain, that is insecure of what the year will bring. I pray, O oh God, that you would bolster it this day to rally them to this battle cry, this hope that we have, a living hope in Jesus Christ, our Lord. I pray that you would encourage them and remind them, O oh Lord, of the joy of their salvation that is wholly secured in the hands of our King. And I pray, O oh God, for the heart that does not know you yet, the heart that has yet to put their faith in you, the heart that has yet to repent of sin, that they would do so today. That, Holy Spirit, you would grieve their heart. That you'd convict their heart to towards you, towards what their sin has caused and done. I pray that you would turn their hearts to the finished work of Jesus Christ on the cross to save them. Lord, I pray, God, that we would enter into this new year with boldness and confidence knowing that the battle has already been won, 
knowing that we already have the victory, knowing that it is the living God who, who is with us, who goes before us, and who goes behind. God, I pray that you'd make us into a bold people. I pray that you would make us into a people that, that courageously declare your gospel, the good news of Jesus Christ to a dark and fallen world. Lord God, we pray that your kingdom come and that your will be done in this new year. We pray these things knowing that our prayers are heard and that our hope is secure. We pray these things in the matchless name of Jesus Christ. Amen.